everyone. Uh, my name is Haley, uh, but you can find me pretty much everywhere on the internet as Scarlet Sparks. Uh, that is actually my stage name. I have a background in performance, uh, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. Um, and uh, it just so happens that uh, most of my online profiles are uh, sort of geared towards when I was performing, including my GitHub profile. So this is my work handle. <laughs> um, I do work at GitHub. Uh, where I am a manager, we have those now, of the <laughs> account support team. And uh, if you think about uh, technical support as being primarily uh, computer problems, uh, then account support is the human problems. And in fact, when I applied for that job, uh, it was originally called non-technical support. Uh, and we decided to change that shortly after I started when we realized that um, phrasing that in the negative felt really weird. Uh, and let me make sure I've got notes here so I don't forget what I'm talking about. Um, and so I deal with human problems. That's sort of my specialty. Uh, I actually don't have any background in tech. Uh, and so when I started two and a half years ago at GitHub, it was this whole new world to me uh, where I was sort of trying to figure out how computers work. Turns out I hear that most of the people who do have a background in the tech industry, also don't know how computers work, so that's fine. I feel less alone. Um, but I do kind of know how humans work, and as Gabriella was just talking about, we are primarily storytellers. Uh, I, I think that's uh, one of the defining characteristics of us as creatures. And uh, so when I started working in tech, uh, I'm trying to understand this, this whole new community, this whole new world, um, and basically a new language. And the way that I did that was by coming up with just really complex analogies that don't make sense to anyone else. I'm, I'm a metaphor machine, basically. Uh, and so in, in thinking about this, uh, I started comparing the open source world to my background in performance. And uh, I realized that there were a lot of similarities, a lot of overlap uh, between uh, my background in improv-based performance, primarily group improvisations, uh, and this open source world. And so I gave a talk about that, focusing on um, this idea in improv of saying yes. When you're doing theatrical improv, uh, you want to move the scene forward by saying yes. So the rule if you're doing a collaborative improv scene is that you, you can't say no to a yes or no question. You have to say yes. Uh, and in fact, you're supposed to say yes and. Uh, so. You're building a story, and the first part is what allows the story to move forward. If you say no, it blocks the story, whereas saying yes uh, to what your fellow artist is proposing makes a connection with them and lets the creative energy move around. Uh, on the other hand, refusing to participate in their idea breaks the continuity of the story and their energy is blocked. So this is essential for your creative processes, but it's also kind of a great attitude to have in life when you can manage it. Saying yes to ideas and experiences can mean the story of your life expands in scope. So a friend of mine actually sort of formalizes this into a little game. He goes to San Francisco a couple of times a year, and he says while he's there, any social activity that's proposed to him, no matter how ridiculous it sounds, he has to say yes to. And he's roped me into this a couple of times. So I once found myself in a, in a black car driving from San Francisco to Santa Cruz on my way to a medieval Renaissance fair to see, uh, I can't remember his name, but he's a magician who also works at Apple as a senior developer there. And, um, and <laughs> with not just this friend who I had just met, uh, but also two Canadians I had never met before until this drive. It was quite the adventure. So uh, that was probably one of uh, my favorite memories of that summer, and it happened because I said yes to this crazy idea. Um, and so the second part, the and in the yes and, is where collaboration happens. Uh, so you take the other person's idea, you accept it, you build on it, and you add your own input. So the goal, creatively and in life, is to feel really good about saying yes to things. And we want to create a safe space for that. So how? How do we say yes as, as much as possible, as much as we want to? I think we do that by saying no by setting boundaries. And that is primarily what this talk is about. Uh, so um, communication is something that I think about a lot. Uh, it's pretty much the, the be all and end all of my job um, is communicating with other people. And
And uh, so as I was sort of going on this journey, uh, thinking about making that open source improv talk, I was also trying to read up as much as I could on um, how computers communicate and what's inside the brains of these crazy things that I don't understand. Uh, and, and doing that, I uh, started reading Charles Petzold's Code, uh, The Hidden Language of Computer Hardware and Software. And in that book, he spends a lot of time breaking down the basics of communicating information. And from there, how we feed that information into machines to make them do our bidding. Uh, he stresses that the minimum base counting system for a code to convey meaning is two digits. The key word here is two. Two types of blinks, two vowel sounds, two different anything really can with suitable combinations convey all types of information. So up here we have a blank white screen. Uh, it's a continuous unvaried signal that conveys pretty much no information. It doesn't tell you anything all on its own. This is a black screen and it tells you nothing as well. In order for this to say anything, it needs boundaries. It needs to be defined by at least one thing that's different. So this of course is uh, barcode and it conveys lots of information to you know someone who has the language to read it um, and when you combine those black and white spaces with timing it conveys all kinds of stuff so we communicate this differentiation to machines using ones and zeros signal lack of signal close switched or open uh, humans also have this idea of binary, uh, but we also have lots and lots of extra words at our disposal to convey information more efficiently. But the two essential ones that we have are right here, yes and no. Of course, with Ruby and other high-level languages, uh, you don't need to painstakingly tell all the hardware in the machine specifically what to do. Uh, with increased abstraction, though, when, you, when you're getting into those higher languages, you risk losing some precision. Um, so exactly how your words get executed is in the hands of the interpreter or the, pro or the compiler. Uh, so similarly, similarly, humans have some high-level language of our own. Uh, it's really comfortable to say, just like, you know, I'm not gonna use JavaScript as an example because I hear nobody likes to use that. We'll stick with Ruby. Um, uh, it, it's, really, it's really comfortable to use, right? Because it feels more like uh, a language. It's a little bit more abstract, um, but it may not be interpreted by the listener exactly as intended. So here we're looking at this word, maybe. Uh, it's a pretty squishy word, right? Um, to, to quote Charles Petzold again, Tony Orlando did not sing, tie half of a yellow ribbon if you want to think about it for a while, or tie a blue ribbon if you don't love me anymore but you'd still like to be friends. Um, instead, he made it very, very simple. So if you need to be precise when you're communicating, and if you're communicating boundaries, you will probably do, uh, it helps to get as low level as possible. Uh, so we don't want to be working uh, with maybe or kinda or you know probably uh, those um, those are difficult uh, for the other person to interpret. And so as a listener, you're also going to want to be cautious uh, if you're hearing someone use those squishy words. They may not be running quite the same on your operating system as they did on the speakers. So you want to ask again. You want to decompile that, put it back together, see if uh, what you're hearing is exactly what they meant. And that's where active listening comes in. That's the one where you hear it and then you spit it back out at them. It feels really uncomfortable to do in role-playing exercises when you're in therapy or you know, management workshops, but it's a really useful skill. Um, so you do want to make sure that what you've understood is the same as what they intended. Uh, so another thing that you want to watch out for is inversion of the signal that you're sending. Uh, and I sort of touched on this when I mentioned the name of the role that I applied for. It was phrased in a negative fashion as, as sort of the, the opposite of something else. Um, and you can make, you can do the, the opposite to that. You can make a no sound like a yes uh, by changing the context, uh, by answering the, uh, the opposite question. Um, and this can be really useful when you're trying to create a positive atmosphere. So we did that when looking at the title of this position. Uh, instead of it being non-technical support, which is sort of a negative way of looking at it in what it doesn't do, uh, we looked at what it does do. And um, that's a really handy skill to have when you're trying to create a positive environment in customer service, uh, in sales, uh, basically any, uh, any place where you're trying to 
manipulate the atmosphere a little bit to make people feel good. Um, but again, this can kind of bite you in the ass a little later. Um, <laughs> So when I'm responding to users, I do try to use that phrasing things positively. It feels more creative. It feels like that improv, building a scene where I'm collaborating with them. It feels helpful. Uh, but on the other hand, there are times where doing that, feeling helpful, um, being nice, because I'm Canadian, by the way. I live here. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, I was raised to be nice. Um, and that... It's important to remember that nice is not the same as kind, and setting clear boundaries and expectations is the kind thing to do when you know that you're not going to actually be able to say yes to something really you should probably say no. Uh, and so this comes up in situations like dealing with security account lockouts uh, where if i'm if I know right off the bat that they someone has locked themselves out of their two factor authentication, for example. Um, I'm not going to waffle about what their options may or may not be. Um, I'm, I'm going to be upfront with them. And this is something that I learned through trial and error with having people uh, have very different expectations for what I was going to be able to do for them. Uh, when, because I, I was trying to phrase things like, "Yeah, I'm I'm super sympathetic and helpful," and it didn't it didn't work. They just kept coming back, not understanding that like that was it. That was the last option that they had and you're out of luck, you're gonna have to create a new account. They would have been able to get back to work much more quickly if I had been kind um, and kindly said no. Uh, and so that's something that I, I think is important to, to remember when you're communicating that type of scenario, uh, recognizing where a no is appropriate, even when you want to make something sound like a yes. So okay. We have these two bits that we can use to communicate information. We've got a signal and a silence. So up here we've got a little wiring diagram of a very basic switch uh, to make, you know, it's from code, so it's got the battery at your house and you're trying to make the light come on at your friend's house. And uh, another communication uh, that's demonstrated here is trying to understand which of those bits is which. Uh, is the signal the yes? Uh, is the silence the yes? And so you look at this diagram and you see that right now the switch is open. Um, and it looks like a little door that you can just kind of walk through, right? So if the switch is open and there's no signal coming through, so that's silence. So because you can just walk through that little gate the, that's a yes? No. And I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room knows that. Um, silence means there's no juice flowing through that wire. There's no signal coming through. Depending on timing, that could mean that, that it's no. Um, or it could mean that communication hasn't even started yet. Uh, so to know for sure, you want to see a decisive yes. You want to see that switch closed and that light bulb light up at the end. Which brings me to uh, the issue of consent. And so this is what the trigger warning was about. I know that there uh, are probably people in this room who have had uh, varying degrees of traumatic experiences with the, with the idea of consent. And I don't want to minimize those experiences uh, by what I'm going to talk about, because I'm talking about some scenarios that may seem rather trivial. And uh, the reason that I'm framing it in that way is because I think it's really important to have consent and to know what that means in all aspects of our lives, not just in the ones where we normally think about them. So we usually think about consent in terms of what happens to our bodies. Uh, so in terms of sexual situations, in terms of what happens to us during a risky medical procedure, we have to agree to those things first. Uh, but in order to get good at feeling comfortable in those situations, whether you're the person giving consent or the person receiving it, uh, we need to integrate that everywhere in our lives, from the smallest thing to the biggest thing. And so consent is about having a choice. Uh, it's having agency. It's actively participating in what happens to you and how you interact with the world and events. So it does need a few things to be real. It has to be meaningful. For consent to occur, it, it has to be meaningful in the way I described in the previous section. Yes alone uh, doesn't mean anything if you don't have a meaningful option to say no or if you weren't given the chance. 
So some of the angriest customer support tickets I've received at GitHub were from folks who uh, were receiving email they didn't ask for or who believed that they'd been charged more than they agreed to. Um, and those are situations where they do feel violated. They feel like their space has been invaded uh, by people who were not granted uh, permission to send them contact um, or that they didn't realize they were agreeing to pay money because the print was too fine or the checkbox was pre-ticked or uh, whatever the scenario. So this is a, an example of you know a sort of small thing uh, as we're building apps or services, uh, businesses, that we can think about. Uh, when you ask someone to agree to something, actually ask. Um, make sure that the option is clear uh, and it should be a request, not a demand. Uh, consent should also be informed, which means that the consenting party has all of the context they need to foresee the potential outcomes of their choice and to weigh the risks and benefits appropriately. For example, it means that when you collect someone's personal information, you disclose how you or any third parties plan to use it. When you offer someone a job or enter into pretty much any other structured relationship, whether it's personal or professional, uh, it's clear what you expect from them and what they can expect from you with no obscure fine print or assumptions. So consent is your, your terms of service. Uh, it's your license agreements and contributing guidelines. Informed consent involves being transparent about the consequences of the choice, and it's a collaborative effort. So that does mean that the other person, uh, has you, you have to be trusting them to take the time to read the information that, that uh, you're giving them, to understand it uh, or to hear it openly. And uh, the third thing that is required for consent is it should be enthusiastic. And by this, I don't mean that it's uh, everything is the greatest thing ever. Uh, it, is, um, it, is, it is about the yes being strong, uh, clear, considered, assured, that you know it's happening as a listener. There is no doubt about it. It should be clear as a bell. If a yes is coerced or if it's given because the perceived consequences are so bad as to appear to make the choice no choice at all, it won't be enthusiastic. You're going to hear it muddied, it'll come through weak, and that's a warning sign. Um, if you're in a position of power or privilege relative to the person you're asking, you may not even realize that there could be perceived consequences hidden in your request. So a freelancer may feel compelled to accept more contracts than they can handle for prices that are less than their work is worth because they've got to store up those nuts for winter, right? Um, underrepresented and marginalized groups may feel like they can't say no to extra work or tasks outside their job uh, or outside their job description uh, without jeopardizing their careers. So that may be things like social events that, that are peripheral, but they're kind of expected, right? Like everyone does it and you should be you know, out, and if you're not, then you're not a team player. Um, but that may not be a reasonable thing to ask uh, of everyone, especially if it was not communicated clearly up front. Uh, so when you say no it, to those situations, you may worry that you'll be labeled as uncooperative or not a team player or difficult or bitchy um, for setting healthy boundaries for you. Um, and if you feel that way, if you feel like there are going to be those consequences, you may say a less than enthusiastic yes to things that you can't or don't want to do. So saying no is really, really difficult for a lot of people. And uh, it may be difficult for very different reasons. And if you're asking something of someone, take a moment first to consider the big picture of what you're asking them to do and the entire context and have some empathy for that person's situation uh, and try to understand exactly what it is that they're dealing with that may uh, lead them to need to say no to something. And remember, you are asking, right? You're not demanding. So they do have the option to say no. Um, and you want to consider whether it will come across that way, whether it will feel like an option to them, even if that's your intent, because it, it really is about the effect that it has on the other person and not your intentions. Um, and if, if the consequences, if you think there are hidden consequences there, also consider whether this is a really appropriate thing to ask of that person. Consent should also come first. Uh, so opting out of something that is already happening 
is considerably harder and more uncomfortable than simply saying no in the first place. So, sticking with the technology examples, if you're building what you think of as a super helpful bot that's going to crawl around some kind of site or service collecting people's personal data, scraping profiles, and then repackaging it somewhere else where it's presented and used a little bit differently, um, that may be a really cool idea. Like you, you may be onto something really neat uh, that people would appreciate, except that they're real pissed off that you took their information and they didn't consent to it first. Um, so they will probably react uh, much more favorably if it's something that they can opt into rather than something they have to discover and then opt out of. Uh, on a more personal level, of course, it's already been discussed here, um, you don't touch people without asking first. Uh, and that is something that I wish went without saying, um, but especially if it's someone that you've just met or you're in a, a workplace situation, um, when, you, when you know your friends and your family well, there are ways to communicate consent that are a little bit less explicit than this yes or no thing. Um, but uh, when you're in a situation like this where you're meeting people, uh, at work there's this kind of culture of hugging. So when you say goodbye to someone um, at the GitHub headquarters, there's often this moment where you kind of like, you do this like open elbows thing. Um, but I, I make that really explicit. I don't want anyone to feel coerced into doing it because it's just this expectation that's there. So if I'm uh, meeting someone for the first time and we've gotten to know each other and we've wrapped up, I always ask, you know, are you a hugger? and give them the option before I do the elbows. Um, and you can, you can take that, I like to refer to it as the awkward ask, which is also really good on dates, just saying. Before you lean in, ask. And so here's the, the underlying premise of that is, you are not entitled to anyone else's time or energy or physical space. Um, you can't treat boundaries as a violation of some kind of imaginary commitment because you know if I do the open elbows thing, it's already assuming that someone is gonna participate in that with, with me. Um, and so you need to take a moment to consider your assumptions and reactions to what's gonna happen if someone says no to your offer or your, your question. Um, how do you respond when someone says no to you? Do you feel or act like that person let you down, like they owed you? Do you argue with them? Uh, so like yes is not a foregone conclusion. Asking first doesn't count if you aren't prepared to hear the answer. But then when we do say yes, we have an agreement. Uh, I've set up someone's expectations and it's reasonable for them to uh, then have those expectations for me to do something. So if you're someone like me uh, who habitually says yes to things, you may end up sometimes over committing, taking on too many projects, making a ton of plans with people at unsustainable paces, uh, or promising more of yourself than is reasonable to give. So I have a little guideline that I set for myself that's called the one thing rule, uh, and I try to only commit to one thing per day. Um, and this kind of varies, and your mileage with this will vary as well. Um, and I'm just giving this as an example of just how much people's boundaries can, um, can be different from each other. Uh, so if I'm feeling really healthy and on top of things, that one thing is probably one thing in addition to my regular responsibilities in each of three areas of my life. If I am really worn down, if I am uh, in a period of acute depression, then that one thing might be eating a meal. And that is literally the only thing that I expect of myself during that day. So I think that's a really important spread uh, to acknowledge in yourself. Before you say yes to something, before you commit to something, um, consider just what is reasonable for yourself and what your own boundaries are, not what you think someone else expects your boundaries to be. Um, so the thing is that no one is entitled to my yes, but once I've said it, once I've said that yes, it is perfectly reasonable for them to expect me to actually, you know, like follow through on that project that I said I was going to get done by Friday. And that isn't to say that you can never withdraw your consent. If you realize that you have changed your mind, that you feel differently about it, or that the circumstances are not what you thought you were signing on for, then you can absolutely back out of it at any time. Uh, it is just important to understand, though, that if you, you know, if you do this once with someone and I say, like, you know what, I said I could get that project done by Friday, but I'm not going to, um, 
then they'll probably be understanding. If you do it every week, then people are going to stop trusting you. So this is why it's really important to know those boundaries, know yourself really well, um, and and understand that you know if you're doing this regularly, if you don't have that kind of self-awareness, that there may be some consequences that you'll be perceived as flaky, uh, or that you're setting up expectations that you can't meet. So say yes when you mean yes, and say no when you don't. Get to know yourself really, really well so that you can tell the difference between those two scenarios. In conclusion, I really believe that we can create safe spaces to be creative and to say yes to really like magical, incredible things, um, and to get comfortable doing that. And the key to doing that is feeling safe saying no. And so I'm gonna quote from uh, a book uh, by Melody Beattie called The Language of Letting Go. Uh, and it's a book that's about codependency, uh, which is a condition basically where you find yourself saying yes to a lot of things um, in order to please other people. Uh, that's a very short and uh, unnuanced version of what codependency is, uh, but we'll go with it. Um, so she says, when do we say no? When no is what we really mean. When we learn to say no, we stop lying. People can trust us and we can trust ourselves. All sorts of good things happen when we start saying what we mean. When we can say no, we can say yes to the good. Our no's and our yeses begin to be taken seriously. So I encourage you to go out there and to create those boundaries so that when you say yes, it is enthusiastic, it is meaningful, uh, and it's creative and collaborative, and uh, we can make these safe spaces together. Thanks very much. I am Scarlett Sparks, and thanks so much to Ash.